this session is Professor Zeyem Vudenik from Tel Aviv University. He will talk about some problems of analytic number theory for polynomials of a finite field. Let's welcome our speaker with big applause. Okay, thank you for coming to this last session of a long day. And uh, I hope uh, not to go over time. Uh, what I want to speak about here is uh, related in a way to both the talks we heard earlier in the session, both analytic and, and very algebraic uh, structures. Uh, and it's an attempt I've been making the last few years to understand connections between classical problems in analytic number theory and corresponding problems for polynomials of a function field. And uh, there are surprising connections, uh, some ways to go from one theory to the other and conversely. So I want to discuss uh, one specific such problem. OK, so first of all, it's long been understood that uh, there are analogies between the arithmetic of the integers and the arithmetic of the polynomial ring with coefficients in a finite field. Um, so, for integers, the basic building blocks are the prime numbers. For polynomials, the basic building blocks are played by irreducible polynomials. So the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says that every integer, say larger than one, can be uniquely written as a product of primes. And uh, the corresponding statement that we learn in first or second year of undergraduate uh, studies that every polynomial of positive degree can be uniquely written as a product of irreducible polynomials. And when I say uniquely, there's some uh, irrelevant uh, fudge factors that you have to put in. Uh, these fudge factors have to do with the fact that uh, we don't like to count uh, primes which are negative. So when I say 2 is a prime, uh, there's another prime which is similar to that, which is the prime minus 2. Uh, we don't differentiate them because they differ by a, an invertible element of the ring of integers, and the invertible elements of the ring of integers are plus or minus 1. For polynomials, the invertible polynomials happen to be exactly the non-zero scalars of the underlying base field. And we can normalize all polynomials uh, by requiring them to have leading coefficient 1, or so-called monic. And every polynomial differs from a monic polynomial by multiplication by n. So when I say unique factorization, there's this ambiguity that one has to keep in mind. So uh, when I introduce counting problems, I will usually, usually make that normalization to discuss only monic. So this is a qualitative analog, the, uh, the fundamental theorem for arithmetic, but there are quantitative analogs of, as well that have been known for many, many years. And one of them that I want to uh, discuss now is the uh, statement of the prime number theorem and its analog for polynomials, which is a much simpler theorem. So what is the prime number theorem? Uh, it's studying the asymptotic density of primes. So the, the prime number theorem, which was conjectured by Gauss, is that the density of primes near x is 1 over log x. In other words, if you look at the number of primes up to x, here is the empirical plot of this number, then it is well approximated in a suitable sense by the logarithmic integral, which is the integral of 1 over log t from, let's say, 2 to x. The logarithmic integral is not an elementary function, but uh, asymptotically it looks like x over log x. Symptotically up to terms which are 1 over log x smaller. And when I use this notation of uh, similar, 
it means that the ratio tends to 1. It's a very crude uh, notion of equivalence of asymptotic uh, growth, but it's uh, something that is easy to prove. Um, for technical reasons, um, I will want to count not just primes, but prime powers with a certain weight which was introduced about 100 and, uh, I don't know, 50 years ago. It's called the von Mangold function. And uh, what the von Mangold function is, it's something that uh, vanishes except if you're looking at prime powers. And for prime powers, the way it just weighs them by the logarithm of the corresponding prime. The reason you do that is that this logarithmic integral is a nasty kind of function. You haven't seen it before in high school. And uh, it sort of um, doesn't have a clean asymptotic as far as numerical purposes go. So if you count primes with this logarithmic weight instead, with a Mangold weight, then the prime number theorem becomes a much simpler thing to state. It says that the weighted number of prime powers up to x behaves asymptotically like x. So you've paid the price. And so instead of looking at the complicated answer, you've substituted the slightly more complicated counting function. But they are the same. If you haven't seen it before, just think of it as counting primes. OK, so this is the prime number theorem. Let me show you some empirical evidence for this theorem. So if we are physicists, we don't like theorems unless they are backed up by numerical evidence. So this is uh, a table that Gauss made up. So this lists, let's say, the first three million number of first three million primes, which is 216,000 and something. He computed numerically the logarithmic integral, which is 216,970. And uh, the answer is pretty close. Here is a more modern table. So for instance, the number of primes up to 10 to the 12 is uh, uh, some big number, 37,607 million and some change. I didn't compute the logarithmic integral. Uh, all, one know, all I've shown you here is that the difference between the logarithmic integral and the actual count of the primes is 38,000 and something. So you can see that not only is the ratio between li and pi tending to 1, but the difference is actually very small. OK, so this is uh, maybe better than the proof of the prime of the theorem because it's visibly a good fit. And the goodness of fit is the subject of the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis says that the width of this column measuring the difference between the actual number of primes and the logarithmic integral is roughly half of the width of the actual number. In other words, the difference between pi and li is about square root of x. And this is called the, this is one version of the Riemann hypothesis. Unlike the prime number theorem, which states that the ratio is 1, this is still a conjecture unless someone in the next two days is going to announce otherwise. OK, the standard way to formulate the Riemann hypothesis is to go through the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Um, so the Riemann zeta function is written here. It's the Dirichlet series of 1 over n to the s, the unique, the unique factorization to prime, the fundamental theorem for arithmetic, allows us to rewrite this as an infinite product over primes. Uh, this was known to Euler, but maybe before him. And Riemann's uh, paper from 1858 showed that this function, which converges, this series of product, which converge for real part of s bigger than 1, actually has an analytic continuation to the entire complex plane, except for a simple polytheistic, so s equals 1. And it has a functional equation relating its value at s to its value at 1 minus s. And Riemann's hypothesis is that all the so-called non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function lie on the line of symmetry of the functional equation. So from this line, real part of s equals a half. This turns out, and this was Riemann's discovery, that it's completely equivalent to the earlier formulation of the Riemann hypothesis 
in terms of the quality of approximation of pi by line. Okay, so this is the theory over the integers. This is the conjecture. Let's turn to the theory for polynomials over a finite field. And there, uh, we want to count prime polynomials, that is, irreducible polynomials normalized to be monic. And uh, you can count them. Uh, you have to measure the size of the polynomial. One convenient measure of the size of the polynomial is its degree. So we look at all polynomials of degree n, which are monic. The number of such polynomial is q to the n, if q is the cardinality of the finite field involved. And we want of these q to the n polynomials to ask how many of them are irreducible. And the prime polynomial theorem, which is an exercise, I should emphasize, that was known certainly to Gauss, but maybe before him, is that that number is the total number of monic polynomials of degree n divided by the logarithm of that number to a suitable base. Plus a remainder term, which is smaller, and how much smaller it is, it's about square root of the main term. So it's like the statement of the prime number theorem, except with the remainder term, which is of the quality that's predicted by the Riemann hypothesis. So this is, looks like a very strong statement, and it is a strong statement, except that it's very easy to prove it. Uh, and just to match the earlier statement that we have, uh, so x, which is the number of primes up to x, uh, so when we count the number of primes up to x, at the back of our minds is that we're comparing to the total number of positive integers up to x. And when we count monic polynomials of degree n, we compare, uh, when we count prime polynomials of degree n, we compare with the number of monic polynomials of degree n. So if we want to set up a dictionary, we match x with q to the n. And then this q to the n over x is, over n is like x over log x. And this remainder term is like the square root remainder term. Okay, so this is uh, old stuff. So the prime number theorem was proven about 120 years ago or so. The prime polynomial theorem was probably known 200 years ago. Um, I, I now want to go beyond the statement of the prime number theorem. So uh, instead of studying the large scale density of primes, so the number of primes from 1 to x or from x to 2x, I now want to understand the fluctuations of this density, which means I look at what happens in short intervals. This is a very traditional subject in analytic number theory, to take a function which has some long-range regularity and try to understand its fluctuations in, in uh, short scales, because the functions we are concerned with are not smooth functions. The indicated function of the primes is not a continuous function. It fluctuates very widely because the prime factorization of integers is not a continuous thing. So let's try to count primes in short intervals. Uh, I do this technical thing of counting with the weight. Again, it's a cosmetic thing. The answers are nice. So we ask how many primes there are in an interval of length h around the big number x. And the length will vary with x. If I look at primes, at intervals of size 1 around x, I'm not going to get something very uh, nice because it will fluctuate very well. So I have to make the length of the interval grow with x. Okay, now the prime number theorem predicts that the number of such primes is roughly the length of the interval divided by the density of primes in that interval, which is 1 over log x. So if you count with a logarithmic weight, you, you expect that the sum of these von Mangold functions, this weighted count of prime powers in that interval of length h, should be about asymptotically h. And the prime number theorem says this is indeed the fact. If you take very long intervals, intervals of length x, if you're counting around x. The Riemann hypothesis gives you a 
says that the logarithmic integral is a very good approximation and the deviation is of size square root. And when you translate it to statements about primes in short intervals, it says that uh, the number of such primes, the weighted number of such primes, is still the expected number as long as the interval has length bigger than square root x. But we don't know this because we haven't proved the real number. What was, I think, a major surprise was that um, one can prove uh, that there are intervals of size which are much smaller than x, so a, a smaller power than x, where this asymptotic formula still holds, where you are guaranteed to have a lot of primes. And this was discovered by Oheiser in the 1930s. It uses uh, what uh, Trevor Woolley uh, referred to, zero-free regions, the zeta function and the best result known nowadays is that uh, this expected asymptotic continues to hold for intervals which are slightly longer than square root x. Like, so the power of the exponent is 7 over 12. And the conjecture is that the expected behavior is h as long as you take intervals which are growing like some small power of x. Any small power of x is OK. Now, if you look at intervals which are size less than log x, you don't expect any regularity because the prime number theorem predicts, says that the, x, the mean spacing between nearby primes is log x. So if you look at shorter intervals, you don't get anything interesting. So you have to look at intervals which are growing faster than log x. What was a major surprise, uh, a discovery in the 1980s, that if you take integral, intervals whose size is, let's say, log x to the 2014, you may still not have the right number of primes in there. This, this is called the Meyer phenomenon. It was discovered by Helmut Meyer. So the conjecture is that as long as the intervals of length, a power of x, any small power, you still get the right number of primes. But it's not true if you look at shorter intervals. This is just a fact. You can't fight the truth. Uh, in the 1940s, Atlee Silver showed that even though there are deviations, which I don't think were known about at the time, but if you ignore some small number of intervals, you get the correct asymptotic formulas as long as you take intervals which, whose length is, let's say, bigger than log squared. Okay, so the density, the, the conclusion to the slide is that the number of primes in a short interval is expected to be the one given by the prime number theorem if it held for very short intervals. But we don't know that at present. There is a hard barrier at square root of x which is given by the Riemann hypothesis, but even that we don't. Okay, now if you want to prove almost everywhere statement, one way, not the only way, to get to them is to make a computation of variance. If you have a random variable uh, which you want to show is zero almost surely, one way to prove that is to show that its second moment is zero. <coughs> if you do that, then almost certainly the random variable is zero. And this is what uh, one way to proceed. And this was uh, explored by Dan Goldstein and Hugh Montgomery about 30 years ago, who studied the variance of the number of primes in a short interval. So they conjectured that if you look at this variance, the difference between the actual number of primes and the predicted answer average and <coughs> take the mean square, then the answer should be h. The expected number is h. So the mean squared being h says that typically this difference is of size square root of h. So it's much smaller. And then there's uh, lower order terms predicted. So it's h times log of x. x is where we are doing the averaging, minus log of h, which is the h is the length of the interval. And then um, about 25 years, uh, 15 years later, uh, Montgomery and Sound added a, a correction term, which is uh, of low order. For numerical work, it's very important to have such terms, otherwise you don't see the expected behavior. 
And this is expected to hold as long as this, uh, it's not obviously false. Um, so this is a conjecture. We don't know how to prove this, I want to emphasize, but it's a very detailed conjecture. Okay. Now they showed that this conjecture, is, conjecture follows from another fact, another, let's call it conjecture, about the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So before I said that the quality of the approximation in the prime number theorem is governed by the location of the real parts of the zeros, the Riemann hypothesis. Here there's a finer feature that the variance in the number of primes in short intervals is governed by some other property of the zeros, and that property is called the pair correlation conjecture. And I want to describe what it is. Okay, so the pair correlation conjecture is, in my mind, one of the few new things that we know about the zeros of the Riemann zeta function since Riemann. Okay, so Riemann made this conjecture. So, no in the sense of a scientist, not no in the sense of a mathematician. Right? This is, this is a huge difference. So, Riemann discovered that the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, the non trivial zeros, all lie in the line with that part of the sequence. It's half. We don't know how to prove it, but it's a fact. If you don't believe it, you don't belong here. It's late in the day. I have to wait before. Um, what Hugh Montgomery studied was the gaps between nearby zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And uh, so here is a plot of uh, what's called the pair correlation functions. So you look at all pairs of distinct zeros of the zeta function up to a certain height. You normalize them correctly. I don't want to describe normalization. And then look at the proportion of such pairs whose normalized difference is less than a given number. And the conjecture is that this has an asymptotic value which is given by that integral of the sine kernel. Okay, and this is a plot. The squares are the empirical, the numerical evidence, and the smooth plot is this density. So it looks pretty good. This is a plot that was made by Andrew Litzko, who produced the data for the zeros. On purpose, I didn't take a very good plot. Okay, so this is a co another conjecture, and uh, Goldson and Montgomery sh showed that this a form of this conjecture implies a formula for the variance of primes and short intervals. So this is an arithmetic meaning of this conjecture. Okay, what is notable here is that th this density, the sine kernel, vanishes at the origin. And the way it's interpreted, it says that there's a very small probability of zeros of the Riemann zeta function to lie close to each other after <coughs> you measure them in the space of the mean spacing, on the scale of the mean spacing. So this, in the physics literature, is called repulsion. Um, and then the story is that uh, Freeman Dyson pointed out that this sine kernel is the same answer that occurs when you try to compute the same function, not for zeros of the Riemann zeta function, but for eigenvalues of suitable <coughs> ensembles of random matrices. Okay, so this was a very pregnant observation and spawned many, many uh, discussions and papers in the last 20 years or so about uh, the validity of this kind of conjecture for primes and for uh, other problems, not necessarily in number theory. Now, I want to go back to polynomials over a finite field, okay, and discuss this kind of uh, random matrix theory in that setting. So I want to discuss prime polynomials in short intervals, but in order to do that, uh, I have to define what is a, an interval. So, uh, for numbers, integers, we know what is an interval. We just measure all <coughs> points which lie close to a given point. So, I need to say what close is. And to do that, I introduce a norm. 
And the norm of a polynomial, um, one way to define it is to notice that the norm of an integer, the actual value of an integer, is the number of residue classes modulo of that integer. And so you take as a definition of the norm of a non-zero polynomial to be the number of residue classes modulo of the polynomial. And then it's a simple exercise to compute that that number depends only on the degree of the polynomial and it's the cardinality of the finite theory to the degree of the polynomial. Okay. And now, having a norm, I can define what is an interval. I look at all polynomials, which lie close to your base point, close in the sense of this norm. Now, this norm only takes values which are powers of the, of the finite field involved. So I, I, I put this as the parameter. And that mean, what it means is I look at all polynomials whose, which differ from the original polynomial by adding polynomials of small degree. So that, for me, is an interval. And it's easy to compute the number of, po of polynomials in a given interval. It, again, depends on the, on the uh, parameter that you use to define the interval. OK, so having a notion of short intervals, I'm now going to count, try to count prime polynomials in short intervals. And again, I'm going to count them with a the weight because the answers are simple. It's not an essential thing. So psi of f comma h is the number of all prime polynomials in the short interval around <coughs> f counted with the right weight. OK, so until now, this is. Uh, fairly mundane generalization, the, in, in this theory, there are things you can do which go well beyond what you can expect to do with current technology for integers. And maybe one result I want to point out that was proven very, very recently is that we know how to count prime polynomials in short intervals. Unlike the case of what happens over the integers for polynomials of a finite field, one is able to do this at least if you take the right limit. Now, in this theory, there are actually two limits you can take. Right? You want an asymptotic parameter because you're counting primes uh, up to x. You're thinking of x as going to infinity. You're not thinking x is 13. It doesn't really make a very interesting theory to count primes up to 13. So you always think of x as going to infinity in this theory. Here, there are two parameters. There's the degree, which is in and the cardinality of the finite field. The limit I'm going to discuss here today is the limit of large finite fields. So you take q to infinity and you fix the degree of polynomials involved. And the statement is that uh, we have an asymptotic result for the number of prime polynomials in a short interval, which is the expected asymptotic plus a remainder which is smaller than the main term as long as the finite field goes to infinity. So this is a function field analog of the conjecture that I told you about uh, counting primes in short intervals. Oops. OK, let, let me just briefly say that uh, the methods used to prove this theorem are completely inapplicable at this time to the theory over the integers because they use Gallo theoretic uh, methods. And uh, so this is something that's very special to polynomials because being a prime polynomial has a meaning in terms of Gallo theory. It says that the Gallo group acts transitively on the roots. I don't know of such a statement for integers. So we're dead. But dead in the water if we want to extend the proof. But the statements are the same. And then once you do this Gallo group computation, there's a general equidistribution type statement, uh, which is a version of Dirichlet theorems of, pri of primes in arithmetic progression, which is special to function fields here. OK, so I won't say any more about this. Once we know the asymptotic, or even before we know the asymptotic, I want to go and try to compute an analogous quantity to the 
quantity that Gauss and Mungaro were trying to compute, namely the variance of prime and short intervals. So I formed the same quantity. So I think of the number of primes in a short interval as a random variable, and I want to compute its statistics. The first statistic would be the expected value. That's easy. We know that's synthetic, but the expected value is a trivial computation. And I want to co compare, to study the variance of this number. When I say variance, I take the location of the short interval as random. I average over all locations. Okay. And uh, here is the theorem that I uh, proved with uh, John Keating from Bristol. Uh, it says that in this limit of large finite field, we are able to compute the variance. And here's the answer. So. Uh, the variance is A capital H, which is the length of the short interval, so exactly as it should be in the theory over the integers, decorated by a matrix integral. Okay, so what is this integral over? It's over the unitary group of size given by the base point, the degree of the base point, and the parameter that we use to define a short interval. Uh, and I'm computing the second moment of the trace of uh, the nth power of unitary, a random unitary matrix. So this is the answer. Again, this is in the limit of Q going to infinity. Um, the theory gives the answer in this form as a, as a matrix integral. Now, if you want to do anything with this, it's not a bad idea to actually compute this integral. Computing this integral, uh, you can think of it as an exercise in representation theory or combinatorics or whatever. Uh, we know how to do this, and people before us know how to do this. So the integral, the, the expected value of the trace of an nth power of a random unitary matrix is a simple formula. You plug in this formula and you get this answer for the variance of prime polynomials in the short interval. Now I want to compare this to the goldson Montgomery conjecture. Okay, so the goldson Montgomery conjecture is they're counting prime poly uh, not poly prime integers in a short interval and taking the mean square, computing the variance, and the answer is the length of the interval. So that says that this difference is of size square root of the main term. <coughs> That same thing happens here, then times a logarithmic correction. <coughs> so you have log of x. That turns out to be exactly the analog of n here. So we're looking at integers near x, centers of windows near x. Here we're looking at centers of windows of degree n. Then you subtract the logarithm of the length of the interval. That's this little h here. And then there's a constant, and there's a constant here. Why the two matches that is a story that I won't go into. But it turns out to be the exact same answer once you set up a suitable dictionary. Except this is something you can prove. And as I was telling you, so far we don't know how to prove the goldson montgomery conjecture. We know how to reduce it, or in fact to show it's equivalent to a conjecture about the zeros of the data function, but we know don't know how to that. Okay, now, why are we able to prove such things for polynomials and not for the integers? So, uh, uh, several answers to such a question. One is maybe the theory is simpler than the theory for the integers. Another answer may be maybe the people working on it are cleverer than the people working on the other. If you believe that, then I can sell you some <laughs> other things. And the third, um, I think, correct answer is that there are extra tools for polynomials. So, for instance, I told you being a prime polynomial is a special, is a special thing. It's saying that the Gower group acts transitively. So, the extra tools for polynomials that we don't know of, or maybe don't exist, but certainly we don't know of, uh, over the integers. So, here the the argument uh, consists of two main steps, I think. That one is 
analytic, which is to reduce the problem to a problem about zeros, not of the zeta function, because in this theory the zeta function doesn't have interest in zeros, but the zeros of certain L functions, which if you're unlucky in New York, I'll describe a little bit. And the other step is to prove, um, to have an analog of this equidistribution statement that I mumbled about um, in these proof of asymptotic result. Okay, and this is the statement of uh, equidistribution of Frobenius classes. Okay, so let me, in two or three slides, just describe the ingredients. Without, this is an impression, going to be an impressionistic discussion. Don't expect you to follow the details now. Okay, so which L functions are involved? So I have to discuss the analog of classical Dirichlet L functions. So Dirichlet L functions were invented, discovered, invented by Dirichlet when he was studying primes in arithmetic progressions, and they are the basic tools we have today to understand such things. So if those of us who will stay around for the last day will probably hear about it in Professor Zhang's uh, discussion of twin primes. Okay, so to define the Dirichlet L function, I start with the Dirichlet character. This is for polynomials, it's the same theory over the integers. So you take a function over, of polynom on the polynomial ring, a complex valued function I want to emphasize, and uh, which is periodic in this sense, uh, multiplicative uh, and normalized correctly. Uh, we also say that uh, it's even if it's trivial on the invertible polynomials. This is a technical notion, but it's an analogous notion for the integers. And then to such a, a character, one associates with a Dirichlet series called the Dirichlet L function by summing it over a chi of f over the norm of f to the s, the norm we discussed before what it was. And the fundamental theorem of arithmetic for the polynomial ring says that this infinite series has an Euler product representation as a product of all prime polynomials, the same way as the Riemann zeta function has a, an Euler product representation. Um, so here are some uh, properties of this Dirichlet L function. So first of all, if the character is even in this sense, then the, is a trivial zero at s equals zero. Trivial meaning I know what, what it is. That's the definition of trivial. One definition of trivial. Um, and then if the character is non-trivial in a suitable sense, um, then there is an analytic continuation of this L function. And it turns out to be a polynomial in Q to the minus S, Q being the cardinality of the final field. And if the character is primitive, then we know exactly the, the degree of the cell function. It's the degree of the modulus minus 1. And there is a functional equation relating its value at S to its value at 1 minus, to the value of the dual character at 1 minus S. So this is roughly the same as the theory over the integers goes, the same kind of features happen there. What is extra here is that we know an analog of the Riemann hypothesis, of the generalized Riemann hypothesis, and this was proved by André Vey in the 1940s. And it says that all the non-trivial zeros of this Dirichlet function lie on the real part of S equals a half. So that's the analog of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. <coughs> So once we have all these things, I can cosmetically um, arrange this data. So I take this L function, which is a polynomial in Q to the minus S. There's a trivial zero. Let's say if the character is even, which is what is relevant to me. So I isolate the trivial zero out. And then the other, the other part, I write as the characteristic polynomial of a suitable matrix because I know all the zeros lie on the real, line real part of S equals a half, I can write them, the zeros in a normalized form, and the upshot is that uh, this L function, once you take away the trivial zero, 
is the characteristic polynomial of a, of a unitary matrix, which I've introduced artificially here, just by writing the, the, what the zeros are in terms of the real parts. This matrix, which is unique up to conjugation, is called the unitarized Frobenius matrix. It has a different source, and people who went to the lecture before mine will have recognized, will have seen it, but I'm not discussing that here. Okay. A, a fundamental fact about these conjugacy classes, about the Frobenius conjugacy classes, is that as you vary the characters of all even characters modulo t to the n, so for me the interesting modulus is t to the n, why not? As you vary over all even characters, this collection of matrices becomes dense, in fact uniformly distributed in the appropriate unitary group. This is a fundamental fact that was only discovered and proved two years ago. By, uh, so it was proved by Nick Kant, it was a conjecture class. So uniformly distributed means that uh, you can sample any nice function in the conjugacy classes of the unitary group. If you sample them over these Frobenius matrix, which is an average, then in the limit of large finite field, it's the same thing as averaging this nice function over all unitary matrices. Okay, so this is uh, Cax's vector distribution theorem in this context. Okay, and um, what this allows me to do is to compute this variance. So I do this in two steps. The first thing is to connect, relate the variance to a quantity for the zeros of these other functions. So the variance suitably normalized turns out to be the mean value of the, nth, of the trace of the nth powers of these Frobenius matrices. So this is encoding short primes and short intervals by zeros of L functions. And then I apply a crude distribution, meaning I replace the average of this nice function over Frobenius classes by the corresponding continuous limit by the integral. And then this integral is easy to compute. So this is uh, what allows me to compute this variance. And as I've said, it matches exactly to the Boleson Montgomery conjecture. Okay, so what I want you to get from this talk is that uh, we can study analogs of problems in analytic number theory for polynomials of our finite fields. In some cases, you can solve problems which look impossible at this point to do over the integers. Um, and in doing that, you can sometimes shed light on existing conjectures uh, as a sanity check to see if they agree with what you can prove. Um, I have to say that there is one instance where we can go backwards, prove something for function fields using these accrued distribution ideas, and then go back and prove something for integers, but that's a more technical talk. There's one other example like this I know, which was uh, alluded to in the last talk, which is the work of Ngo, and it's similar in nature, but that's not something I want to say here. And uh, the reason we're able to do such things is because there are tools for function fields which right now don't exist for integers. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, in most cases, so we can study this and we expect answers which are similar to the answers of the integers. In most cases, I don't know how to prove anything there because the tools I have here are mostly tailored to the large finite field limit. The questions make sense. Usually you can't do anything. There are a few problems mostly to do with set theory where you can do extra things in this other limit that you're referring to. 
But the problems I've discussed here, I don't know how to do uh, in this other way. So, any other questions? Okay, then we'll call over and prepare the gift for the speaker. So, proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attendance. Thank you.